Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, Alex Bozich is here, and it is mailbag time. It's been a while since we've done a mailbag, so we opened it up. We got a couple of audio questions, many other questions submitted in the Inside the Hall premium forum, which you can join yourself at forum.insidethehall.com. I highly recommend it. Uh, Lots of good questions about Indiana's late game execution, what we think the coaching staff should really be focusing on in the offseason, how many minutes Race Thompson Thompson should be playing the rest of the year, uh, and several others, several good ones. So I think you'll enjoy this this mailbag, and uh, we hope that we answered your questions to (laughs) to your satisfaction. Nice to actually be doing this on the heels of a victory. Feels like we haven't had too many recent episodes of Podcast on the Brink where that has been the case. So a little extra jump in our step, I think. Uh, But before we get to that, I do want to pass along a few words from our sponsor, SeatGeek. As you know, getting tickets online can be far too complicated. With hundreds of sites and varying levels of reliability, it's hard to know who to trust. And that's why SeatGeek is the way to go. SeatGeek pulls millions of tickets into one place so you can easily find the seats you want for a price you're willing to pay. There's nothing quite like being there in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. I mean, think about it. You could have been there in person at the Wisconsin game. If you didn't go, you would have gotten uh, a little more than you bargained for with a couple overtimes and just what felt like interminable uh, official reviews. But nonetheless, there are still two big games left for Indiana at home this season against Michigan State this weekend. I'll be in attendance for that game, so if you are going to go to that game, uh, please let me know on Twitter, at Assembly Call. would love to shake your hand, and thank you for being a listener. And then, of course, the Rutgers game, which will be our last time to see Romeo play, our last time to see Juwan play. So a couple of really good opportunities to get there and see your Hoosiers. And SeatGeek will have the best prices that you can find on tickets. And, you know, SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever, which is why I use them. They search multiple ticket sites. They grade every ticket based on value. And that's how SeatGeek helps you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. And every purchase is fully guaranteed. So you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone. As I said, it's what I use to shop for tickets, whether it's sports tickets, concert tickets, anything. If I need live tickets, I'm going to SeatGeek. And best of all, listeners to Podcast on the Brink get $10 off of your first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, today. That's promo code BRINK for $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets. And now, on with this week's mailbag. All right, Alex, we put out a call for questions in the Inside the Hall Premium Forum. Uh, As I mentioned in the intro, you can go to forum.insidethehall.com to learn more about that. For my money, the best place to uh, discuss Indiana basketball. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy all the discussions that I get to take part in there. But we got some good questions, and are you ready to answer them? I am. It's uh, it's nice to be uh, having a podcast after a win for once. It feels like they're... It feels like the... It's been uh, pretty dire here for the last uh, month and a half. So uh, g- good to be with you uh, with a uh, with a win uh, coming off a win. You know, it's one of those weird things. Like the Michigan State win, like just emotionally as a fan in the moments after it. You know, the Michigan State win was so satisfying, and the Wisconsin win was so satisfying. In part because of how rare those wins have been over the last couple of months. And so it's always kind of nice to feel that way. But then as soon as I feel that way, I'm like, all right, I'm kind of ready to go back to like, not necessarily taking wins for granted, but where it's like, all right, we got another one, you know, and it's a little bit more matter of fact, than like this big emotional catharsis because we finally won a game. So it's, you know, it's like the, it's a double edged sword, I suppose, but I am, I'm ready for this to become much more routine than it's been. Yeah. It's the interesting part about this season is you mentioned winning at Michigan state is so rare and beating Wisconsin has been so rare in recent history uh, that of all the seasons for those things to happen, this feels like the the last one where it would. So uh, but maybe, maybe it's, it's the one where we needed the most, <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Uh. For sure. The, the, you're right. Those, uh, 
beating Wisconsin and, and winning at Michigan State, I feel like, are two of the more elusive things uh, for IU fans to experience uh, in the last 15 to 20 years. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, a sign of things to come in the future years. Yes, hopefully. Hopefully. All right. Well, we got two questions submitted to our voicemail line, so we will start with those and then a bunch after. Uh, so we'll see how many we can get through here. And here is the first question from Quang from the Premium Forum. But what roster turnover as well as position turnover will be after this season? Oh, wait. Let me go back to the start of that question. This is Quang from the Premium Forum. Can you give a guess at what roster turnover as well as position turnover will be after this season? So I think your philosophy on this is similar to mine in that, you know, when it comes to roster turnover in this age of college basketball, especially when you're still in the early years of a new coach, I don't think anybody would be surprised by some roster turnover, especially given how just crazy this season has been and a long losing streak. And, you know, you deal with that kind of adversity. You know, sometimes you get guys who end up wanting to go elsewhere. It's a topic of conversation. You know, at this point, it's not really worth speculating about any names, uh, but I think you probably share my opinion that you wouldn't be surprised if it happens, but, you know, who knows what those names could be, and we wouldn't speculate on them publicly anyway, even if we did have an inkling of who it might be. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like everyone um, is assuming that there's going to be some type of roster turnover, um, just based on how Indiana has continued to recruit. Obviously, we know that Jawan Morgan is graduating, Evan Fitzner is graduating, Romeo Lankford. Uh, despite um, pleas from Don Fisher at the last uh, Archie Mill radio show for one more year in the in the uh, studio audience shouting one more year, uh, that's not going to happen. So uh, there's going to be at least three scholarships to give and two guys have already signed. So obviously Keon Brooks still out there. Some other guard names have kind of heated up with, uh, you know, Harlan Beverly and, um, you know, the the other, the guard, I don't know how to say his last name. So Quinones, I, I believe. Quinones. There you go. There you go. Him. And, and, we obviously don't know what's going to happen with the grad transfer market. There's been some talk of looking at junior college players as well. But, I mean, I, I think ultimately it's going to be one of the more fascinating things to watch this offseason is, is how the coaching staff, um, you know, kind of builds this roster for next season. Because obviously this year uh, a lot of things didn't work and there's a tremendous amount of pressure next year to be better. And, and I think a lot of it's going to come down to, improving the shooting. So do they feel like they have enough in house to, you know, be better in that regard next year? Do they feel like they can develop guys or do they feel like they have to go outside and, and get some players and some tough decisions might have to be made. Now I, I would never advocate for, um, you know, running anybody off. And I don't think uh, I use athletic department, whatever, go for something like that. But at the same time, you also have to have realistic conversations with everybody and say, Hey, this is kind of what we're seeing uh, for your future, for your role. And, is this kind of aligned with what you see? And if it's not, I mean, there's no, there's no, I don't think if, if somebody wants to leave or it's a mutual thing where, or, or somebody wants to go for a better opportunity somewhere else or have a chance to play more, I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing. It happens everywhere in college sports. And uh, I, I think we'd be foolish to think that uh, that's not going to happen at some point uh, with uh, Archie Miller and, and, and uh, IU basketball. It hasn't happened to this point, obviously with, with any attrition, but uh, I think there's going to be obviously some changes to the roster this off season, but I think it would be unfair at this point to speculate with any names or kind of, uh, you know, hard, it's really hard to nail down how, how many spots could be available. Yeah. But it's, it certainly will make for an interesting off season. And, you know, to Quang's second, the, the second part of his question, the position turnover, what's going to be really interesting. I think watching now, you know, kind of how this program evolves is, as you said, you know, you're going to lose Romeo, you're going to lose Juwan your two highest usage players where so much of the offense has run through those guys and they have delivered so much. I mean, they're the reason why Indiana, you know, has been so effective at finishing at the rim. And I mean, they have been, you know, when Indiana's offense has worked well, I mean, they've been such a major part of it on the flip side. They are two of the guys who have taken the most threes for Indiana <clears throat> and they have not shot it well. So, I mean, they have really driven a lot of Indiana's poor three point shooting. Not that, you know, Rob and Al and the other guys have been shooting lights out, but they all at least shoot at kind of a national average level. And so it's going to be interesting, you know, because Indiana is going to have to find go-to guys offensively. There's no question. And people are going to have to step into those roles. And I don't think you'll find anybody on next year's team that maybe uses as many possessions as those two guys. The shot distribution will probably be much more even. You know, and so that's the challenge. 
On the flip side, the biggest issue for this team has been three-point accuracy. And to a certain extent, while I think we need to get more shooters in the program and the guys that are here have to shoot better, I think just by virtue of better three-point shooters getting a higher percentage of the looks, we will probably shoot better from outside next year. And that will help alleviate that issue. It's just now you have to compensate for what you lose with guys like Romeo and Juwan. And that's, you know, that's what we don't know. And that's where, you know, how healthy is a guy like Jerome Hunter? How ready is Trace Jackson Davis to step in from day one and play big minutes? You know, where does Race Thompson's offensive game develop? How ready is Deron Davis to play 25 minutes and be a focal point on the block? A lot of those things will determine the ceiling for what Indiana's offense, and it's, you know, and obviously it's defense too, can be. But I think it will be interesting that the shooting, I think, overall is going to improve simply because you're going to have better shooters taking a higher percentage of the jump shots. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty much a given that the shooting is going to improve when you look at the numbers. And and I've been tracking kind of the Indiana's three-point shooting this season, the percentage in terms of where it ranks historically uh, for Big Ten teams in the Ken Palm era. And right now, uh, given their performance the last game, 6 of 20, they've escaped the seller of the worst three-point shooting team uh, from a percentage uh, standpoint in Big Ten plays since 2001, 2002. They're slightly ahead of uh, that Nebraska team. I think it was 2014, 15 maybe uh, that I mentioned or one of those seasons where Nebraska was just uh, downright awful. But Indiana's, I think, a tenth of a percentage now ahead of that team. So we're talking, this isn't just bad three-point shooting. This is historically bad. And so I think you have to assume that they're going to get better. The other key area for me, not just the three-point shooting, but for a team that seems to – or for an offense that seems to value getting to the basket and drawing fouls, the free-throw shooting just has to get better. I mean, that's something that can be developed. We talked a lot about that with Jordan Holes uh, in our podcast a couple weeks ago that, you know, that's a a matter of what you emphasize and uh, as a player uh, and what you work on. And, you know, I think that to me is – uh, a huge opportunity for Indiana to improve in the offseason. So if those two things just get marginally better, I think obviously you're going to have a, a better uh, offense potentially, but but then uh, you, you're going to have to have uh, more consistency uh, from some of the guys that are going to have to step into bigger roles next season, uh, obviously. And there's going to be a lot expected of Trace Jackson Davis. I don't think he's necessarily going to be ready to shoulder a huge offensive load, but he's going to at least have to be able to come in and score 8 to 10, 12 points a game as a freshman. Uh, to at least kind of swallow up some of that um, production that's going to be departed, or it's going to be uh, left uh, by by Jawan's absence. Yeah, <clears throat> and you mentioned the free throws. I mean, that's where Indiana is really going to have to replace Romeo because he's their most reliable player at drawing fouls. And even though he struggled early in the season, he's become their most reliable free throw shooter as well. So, you know, I, I don't I don't mean to downplay what it's going to mean having to replace those guys. It's going to be huge. Um, and, I'm, you know, I'm sure it'll take an adjustment for a lot of guys, as it does every season when guys change roles. But it'll certainly be one of the more interesting things to watch as we go into next season. All right, let's get to our second voicemail question. <clears throat> this one is from Archie One. Hi, this is Archie One. Quick question on the eight late game execution. Uh, it seemed fine at the beginning of the season, but it seems like every single game there will be a late game situation where Archie's drawing something up out of a timeout, and it just turns into a complete and utter disaster. Last night, it was a dribble handoff from Duran to Romeo, and it got fumbled, and somehow it luckily just ended in the hands of Rob, and we were able to make a play out of it. We, we're not even getting a shot off a lot of the times let alone we're never getting a clean look or a good look at anything. Do you think this is on Archie as a coach or players? I mean, I'm guessing it's somewhat both, but I'm starting to have long-term concerns about the lack of late-game execution with Archie as their coach. Um, just would like to hear your guys' input on this. Thank you. It's a really interesting question, Alex, and I think it's something that a lot of people have been wondering about during this slide. You know, it's important to remember, and, you know, I think Archie One references this, that early in the season, Indiana was really doing a nice job of executing down the stretch. And while a lot of people were saying, hey, you know, you're winning some close games and, you know, that that may even out later in the season, which is obviously proven true. It wasn't like it was a lot of lucky bounces in those games. I mean, it did seem like Indiana was pretty composed and, and just made some smart plays. 
And so to me, you know, there are a few issues that I feel like I've seen during this losing streak, and I want to get your thoughts on it. You know, one is, you know, obviously the the injuries and the different lineups don't seem to have helped. You know, and it, this definitely seems like an offense that hasn't had chemistry. And one of the guys who was so important in the late game execution early in the season was Rob Finnessy. And it just now feels like he's back to being the guy he was after coming back from the concussion. The other thing is you are relying on a lot of young guys out there in clutch situations that are you know dealing with it for the first time. Rob and Romeo and you know Al Durham is still a sophomore and you know Jawan obviously is very experienced. But even him, you know, you think about the play down the stretch at Purdue where he gets the ball and just dribbles off his leg. You know the the experience didn't seem to help him there. So I think there have been some times where it seems like something good is drawn up and yet the execution isn't there. But I do think ultimately it falls back on the coaches because it's the coach's responsibility to have these guys prepared with things that they're confident in doing late in games. And that's where it seems like Indiana just doesn't really feel – everything feels very tentative, maybe in part because of the struggles and the lack of confidence, but maybe just because they don't quite feel comfortable with what they're doing. And you know what I wonder and what I'd like to get your perspective on is it, it does seem at times like there's a lack of creativity down the stretch. Like we know what's coming and the defense kind of you know knows what's coming. And Archie does strike me as a coach that you know has the things that he wants to do and very much wants to put something in, really feel comfortable that you can get it right before you add other stuff to it. You know, and I just wonder if this team, because of the youth, because of the lack of chemistry, because of the lack of shooting, because of the injuries, and maybe just because they haven't taught it as well, like all of those reasons, they don't have a ton of stuff in place that they can go to late in games. And that, you know, whether he should just try to do it anyway or, you know, whatever you think of that, I wonder if that factors into it some just because it kind of seems like that's his philosophy. So, you know, to me, I think with all these things, it's kind of multifaceted, but. You know, what do you think about that, and what do you think ultimately are the biggest reasons for the late game execution problems? Yeah, you hear that sigh right there? Well, we'll get to Alex's answer in a second. He takes his answer in a little bit of a different direction than the question I posed than what the questioner posed. So we'll get to that in just a moment because you'll definitely want to hear it. But I do want to remind you about our other sponsor, Home Field, because this episode of Podcast on the Brink is brought to you by Home Field. And at homefieldapparel.com, as you surely know by now, if you've visited their site during the season, and if you haven't, you definitely need to. But when you go there, you'll find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel that is available anywhere. Homefield was started by an IU grad, and all Homefield apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And now that we're well into 2019 and the winter, turn back the clock with Homefield's 1910 IU Crest sweatshirt featuring an IU Crest from 1910 and a tri-blend fleece crew neck. And I'm coming in town this week. I looked at the weather forecast. It looks like it is going to be very cold. So you better believe that I will have my home field tri-blend hoodie with the old school bison logo on it. I love that hoodie. Anytime it's cold, I immediately, <laughs> I at any excuse I have to wear that sweatshirt, I wear it because it's so comfortable and I just think it looks so cool. So you can also find that at homefieldapparel.com. And when you're there, don't forget to use the promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, at checkout, and you'll get 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. Homefield, wear one for the team. And now, here is Alex's answer to the question that I just posed. Yeah, I hate to avoid the question altogether, but I, I don't necessarily view it as a late game problem. I view it as an offensive problem in general. Uh, it's it's not like these things are happening just late in games. We've seen plenty of uh, instances this season where Indiana struggled beginning of games. Uh, we've seen plenty of uh, examples of a team struggling uh, in the middle of games. See the Maryland game where they had a huge lead in the first half and halftime and you know, kind of blew it. The same thing with this early in the second half against Wisconsin. Midway through the second half, they had a 13-point lead and stopped executing offensively, stopped scoring. I mean, this is the 13th best offense in the Big Ten right now. So it's not just the late game offensive uh, problems. It's in general, it's the offense right now just isn't good. And to me, that's somewhat on the players, and it, but it's more largely on on the coaching staff to, to figure out um, because you, you're – the bottom line is at this level of college basketball, um, you can only win so much with, by with, with the, you got to have a good offense and a good defense. I mean, there's not very many examples when you look at Ken Palm of a team that's outside of the top 100 in offensive efficiency ever 
turning into something substantial in terms of you know a postseason team. And so, uh, while, while I do agree with the question, kind of the premise of you know, is there should there be reasons for concern about late game execution? I, I just don't I don't look at it in the way that this is just a late game problem. I look at it as fundamentally right now the offense just isn't very good and. I think one of the things we need to dig into in the off season uh, in terms of just discussion and, and trying to figure out is what, what can be done to, to fix this? Obviously we talked a lot about the three point shooting, the free throw shooting, but kind of what's the long-term plan to make this, this uh, a better offensive team? Because to me to be the second worst offensive team uh, in the big 10, regardless of, of, you know, maybe a lack of role players or kind of a lack of shooting, uh, the, the team should be better than this offensively, and I don't necessarily view it as just a late game problem. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. And you know, this kind of gets into let's hit. There's a couple other questions that are related to this. Um, let me find them. Okay, so this is from I do not know how to pronounce this guy's name. Shunk Quick, <laughs> the premium forum. Uh, what would you like to see as an addition to the assistant coaching staff? Not a specific person, but a capability that would complement Coach Archie. You know, and we have no idea if there will be turnover on the coaching staff or anything, but just in your perfect world, now having seen Archie for close to two seasons, what do you think would be the most important thing that he could bring in another set of eyes, another perspective to help him out with? I mean, I don't necessarily think it needs to be a, a change per se in terms of the personnel of the staff. I just think it needs to be a better because, you know, you have a certain amount of time, right? Each week to practice, you only have a certain amount of time to work with your team in the off season. So ultimately any team, and this is, you can speak to this too, Jared, as someone that is an entrepreneur works for themselves. Like you are in everyday life, kind of what you emphasize. Right. And so if you're not, if, if your emphasis is going to be in the off season, becoming a better offensive team, become, improving our shooting, that has to be on the staff to kind of, you know, have a trickle down effect to the players. And like, this is what we're going to, we, this is what we need to get better at. This is what we have to emphasize whether that's worked on in you know the time that they have together or if it's emphasized that hey this is a personal thing that you need to spend extra time outside of what we do to improve on this um i don't i, I mean i'm a firm believer in in any in any kind of profession anything that you kind of take up um as whether it's a hobby or something that you're doing for a career what you place the biggest emphasis on is what you're going to improve at and and i think that that needs to kind of be the mindset in terms of offensively uh, there, there needs to be a greater emphasis on, on shooting the ball. I mean, I hate to go back to this Jordan holes conversation again, but you know, we were, we talked to him a lot about just hard work and uh, repetition. And um, you know, I don't think, I don't believe in, you know, I do think there's something to be said for natural talent in terms of shooting, but I don't think there's anyone who's a great shooter who just, got to be that because they worked at it, you know, at 40% of their capacity. I think it's the guys who become great. And we saw this with Victor Oladipo who came in and was laying bricks as a freshman to going on as a, as a junior to being a, I think a 40 plus percent three point shooter has gone on to be an all-star in the NBA. He didn't come in a great shooter. He worked on it. He emphasized. And I think there's something to be said for that. And so to me, the, the biggest thing is, you got to put a better emphasis or a, a larger emphasis on becoming a better shooting team because, I mean, yes, you can win with defense, but I don't think you can necessarily get to where you want to be as a team and a program uh, with having an offense this poor. Do you think that, you know, part of this is the guard Archie came in here and took over a program that had an offensive identity? And he is a defensive coach and was kind of tasked with giving the program a new identity. And when you look at the history of other, you know, successful coaches at big programs who have run the pack line, you know, you look at what Tony, what happened with Tony Bennett at Virginia, you know, and their defense showed kind of steady improvement the first few years, the offense really languished. And then after about three or four years, you saw the offense kind of take a quantum leap. It was similar, but not quite as pronounced at Arizona, where the defense improves, the offense stays stagnant, and then kind of years three, four, and five, the offense gets better. Like, do you think, you know, we've heard about, you know, how, you know, this new system is, you know, hard, and, and Colin Hartman talked about on a, a podcast how, you know, it's not necessarily for the freshman 
that it's the hardest to learn, but for guys who have played another system, learning the new habits, it can be really difficult. So it almost, it seems to me just from some of the empirical evidence, like, you know, you put this defensive system in, it's got to become part of your identity. Years three or four, now you've got young guys who have played it. Maybe you have to spend less time defensively. Like we heard last year famously that Indiana was spending 75% of their time on defense. Maybe those things start to even out once you get more institutional knowledge of the defense. And at least if you look at the numbers in some of these other cases, and I don't you know, know, uh, you know anything beyond just what I'm looking at with the numbers, that at least lends, I think, some encouraging examples that with this similar type of system, the offensive growth seems to come a little bit later once perhaps the defense is in. Does that seem fair to as at least like a nugget of hope to grasp onto for fans that are frustrated with the offense? I don't know. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like if, and this is year two, so I urge everyone to be patient and and kind of see how everything plays out. But you know, it feels like right now that this is just kind of the opposite of what some of the Tom Crean years were, right? And that there was a defense that was good enough to win at a really high level, but the offense. Now, with this team, right, the defense is good enough. 25th right now in adjusted defensive efficiency in Ken Palm. People would have killed for that in, in, <laughs> under Crean. Uh, and the, the complaint was it was always, oh, well, we can play offense, but you know we can't guard anybody. Now it seems to be the opposite. Now, I do think, I, I do think it's, I think it's easier probably uh, to get better on offense than it is deep. Like, I think there's more to coaching um, an elite defense than there is an offense because an offense, if you have three or four great players uh, that can make individual plays. Now this team has one, two, you know, depending on how you view Jawan in terms of being elite offensively uh, that, you know, if, if you do have some shooters and you do have uh, elite guys offensively, there's not really, um, a whole lot. I mean, there's some schematic stuff uh, that that falls into it, but ultimately it comes down to making shots. Now, defensively, you have to have, um, I think, more of a a plan, a scheme, and and more connectedness because, um, you know, if, if one guy kind of does the wrong thing, it's 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 a lot easier to to you know if so, in the in the pack line, for example, uh, you can play good defense for. 28 seconds and then one of one guy closes out in the wrong way you give up a three-pointer right it's got to be a kind of a connected group whereas on offense if you have you know two or three great players you can just kind of you know for the most part i mean we saw it early in the season indiana got by with only having two or three great guys so i I do think the offense is going to get better i just to me i i want to see more from the shooting perspective and whether that has to be recruited or whether it has to be developed within the program and I think it's going to get there. I really do. Um, offensively, now, do I think this is going to ever be a an offense that's going to be some of those years that we saw under Crane where it's a top 10 offense? I don't necessarily know that that's going to happen because Archie's, even if you look at his teams at Dayton, they never shot a ton of threes. Like, they never, it was never a huge thing for them, like, to score a lot of points off of three pointers. But, you know, I, I think things you can control on an offense are take care of the ball which needs to get better and shooting free throws and obviously, and just shooting it. Even if you shoot an average percent, if you take care of the ball, if you make free throws and you make threes at an average percentage, you're going to be a pretty good team offensively. I mean, that's, it's pretty simple. So um, long winded answer. Um, but I, I, I do think it's going to be a thing where, you know, if, if he can sustain this, where he's, you know, having a top 25 defense, um, and he can pair that with an offense. You've got something I think that's sustainable in terms of building a, a program that's built for success in the long term. Yeah, you know, the free throw shooting is a little bit concerning just because his teams at Dayton were never as bad as his two teams at Indiana, but they were always in the 200s. You know, so you wonder what kind of emphasis is placed there. You know, with the three point shooting, they were never like extreme in how many they took, but the last four years they were average or better. You know, so they mm-hmm. used the three pointer and and they're actually better from a percentage, you know, standpoint. A couple of years where they were uh, you know, in the in the top fifty there. Um Right. I mean he's not taking a lot now this year because they can't shoot. So right. you can even see him on the sideline sometimes when they take a quick one, he's like, you know, guys, we can't shoot. What are we doing here? Let's try to get a better shot than that. Yeah. Um so give him credit for placing less of uh an emphasis on it but you know 
the, the, the thing I go back to kind of on the offensive thing is we talked about this last week with my dad a little bit, like this team offensively, it, it feels like, you know, they can get a lead of in, I guess maybe coming off the Wisconsin game where they did build a 13 point lead and it almost felt like that was an opportunity to step on their neck and they didn't do it, but yeah. they couldn't make shots threes in the second half. They didn't make any after halftime. They made six in the first half, but it feels like when we've seen IU teams like bury opponents at assembly hall, it's always been, you know, get the get the crowd into it, make a couple of threes, and then you kind of demoralize the other team. And when you can't make shots, you simply can't do that. And so I, I yeah. think even if you're not going to emphasize taking a lot of threes, you got to be able to make them because there's such a it's such a momentum building play uh, in basketball. I, you know, as as much as a crazy dunk can set the building on fire, you start making threes. And and I've seen some of the you know some of the most uh, incredible atmospheres in, in college basketball just kind of taken to a whole other level. Not not just in Bloomington, but I think the three point shot is just a a huge part in being successful. No, no, we are we are in total agreement there. You know, I, I bring up kind of the you know some of the other examples because I know it's really easy in the midst of this losing streak to just get so down on things. And you know, I've just tried to maintain pretty steadfastly that I want to see this thing through four years and kind of judge it then. And part of it is because you look at some of the other examples where this kind of system was brought in, and you didn't really see the real change until years three or four. Now, if we don't see it, I'm going to be you know as concerned as the as the most concerned person. What the last thing I'll say about the offense because you're completely right about the shooting. Indiana has to get better shooters. The other thing that Archie's teams at Dayton always had that he hasn't really had yet at Indiana is consistent point guard play and experienced point guard play. Didn't really have it last year. It We had it some with Rob early in his freshman season. He fell off. We're starting to see it again. You know, Rob pre-concussion was averaging double the amount of assists that he's had since then. You know, was shooting much better from three-point range. And you look at Archie's teams at Dayton, you know, guys like V. Sanford, Scoochie Smith, he always had point guards that had assist rates, you know, between 25 and 30 and sometimes higher. That he hasn't really had. And, I, you know, I wonder, especially for a guy like Archie, who surely sees the game as a point guard offensively, you know, just from his perspective, he really probably needs that guy that is like his eyes and ears on the floor, because that's probably how he sees the game. And so, you know, that's where, you know, you miss on a recruit like DJ Carton. That hurts. But I think everybody has a lot of confidence in what Rob can be, especially as he goes through his, you know, sophomore, junior and senior year. You know, and you look to the future with guys like Christian Lander that Indiana is recruiting. I think it's going to be really important for the long term success and consistency of Archie's program, specifically his offense, to have at the very least very good point guard play. And when Indiana is going to have really good teams, probably elite point guard play, because I think that really the way he wants to run offense, it seems like he really needs that for it to run effectively. Yeah, I mean, look around the Big Ten right now. The, th- the three top t- teams are Michigan State, Michigan, Purdue, right? Purdue has a unique situation in that Carson Edwards is basically a point guard, and a, you know he's he's just an all-purpose guard. I mean, they've got Nojel Eastern, who is technically their quote-unquote point guard, but he's really a defensive stopper, and the ball's not in his hands a lot. Michigan State probably has the Big Ten player of the year in Cassius Winston, and Michigan probably has the best defensive guard in the league and a guy who can just do so much for his team in Xavier Simpson. The biggest failure of the you know Tom Crean was he never found a suitable replacement for Yogi, and it, it, there's never going to be another Yogi because you know he was a great play, one of the one of the best point guards ever played in Indiana. But you know there there wasn't ever anyone brought in behind him that you know that and maybe it was a lack of opportunity hard to hard to recruit to a program where you know the guy's going to be there playing 35 minutes you know for four years but whatever the case may be um, you have to have at the minimum very good point guard play to win at the highest level of college basketball and you really need it to be elite if you if we're talking about you know everyone's asking about you know when's IU going to get back to being nationally relevant well you got to have a great point guard I don't yeah, that's the bottom line. So, I, I think people are optimistic that Fennessey can become that, and I, and, I, and I think Fennessey's been great. I just wonder is he ever going to be? We'll, we'll see. You know, over the next couple of years, how he develops. Is he ever going to be that guy who? And he's shown it at times this year, where he has that burst right and gets to the lane, and scores an easy basket. That's one of the biggest problems right now with Indiana's offense is nothing comes easily. And when you have a great point guard that can get into the lane and break people down. It just makes everyone else on the court better. It makes it easier for them to score when you don't have that. Uh, it, it's it's 
you're, you're fighting an uphill battle. And, and to me, that's, um, you know, it, it's, do, do they need to rec- recruit somebody else um, behind Rob to come kind of learn the ropes and, and maybe potentially even take over if, if it is the more talented guy? I think that's kind of one of the big things that, that we'll uh, begin to get the answer to here in the next two seasons. Rob's ceiling strikes me as somewhere in between Xavier Simpson and Cassius Winston to where I think, you know, his biggest value, I mean, I think defensively, he's already really good, you know, and I think he'll be better offensively than Xavier Simpson. Um, because I think he'll probably be a better shooter. But you look at a guy like Cassius Winston, I mean, I don't think Rob's ever going to shoot 45% from three and have an assist rate, you know, 45%. I mean, Cassius Winston is one of the best offensive point guards we've seen in the Big Ten in a long time. But I think he can be, you know, you take kind of in between the strengths of those two guys where he's better defensively, but not quite the offensive just dynamo that Cassius is. Maybe not next year, but as an upperclassman. I think he's shown enough flashes uh, that, you know, I feel good in his ability to do that moving forward. Um, Chicago Hoosier asked if you were on the staff what is the one single thing you would focus on going into next year whether through recruiting or development other than shooting uh, we have focused a lot on shooting you know I, I think Rob's continued development is going to be big what is the other thing that you think Indiana should really focus on besides shooting wow that's a <laughs> I mean re- re- <laughs> it does all kind of come back to shooting <laughs> yeah it does um Dur- Duron Davis's health and uh, in conditioning. I mean, I would say communication more than yeah. anything else because we had this situation this season where it feels like from the Nebraska game all the way to the Michigan State game where it was guys weren't communicating for whatever reason, and Archie basically admitted as such, you know, the, that the whole um, major drastic change. Everyone was thinking it was going to be some rotation change or um, you know different lineups or certain guys not playing and certain guys playing more minutes it was more of getting back to the basics in terms of communication huddling up after a dead ball guys um, you know talking more on the court and I think that's something that has to be a consistent thing all season long you can't have a situation where the coach is talking in mid-February about how they had to talk it out uh, between the team and kind of get the lines of communication open again. So to me, that's that's something you build in the off season. That's something you build as kind of uh, part of your culture, and and you got to have the leadership in the locker room to be able to do that. But t- to me, that's the that's the biggest thing that I'd uh, like to see uh, improved in the off season. That's one of the reasons I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like, I, you know, you have to recruit skills, obviously, and you have to put skills together for a roster to work, but you also have to be good at recruiting personalities. And if you've recruited a bunch of quiet guys, you know, who maybe don't talk, you know, you may have to focus on recruiting a guy you know, maybe he doesn't have the measurables, but he's going to talk and give you some of the personality things. Like one of the reasons why I'm really happy that we're recruiting Ethan Morton in the class of 2020, you know, I haven't seen him play a ton. And obviously he's a four-star recruit, so he's got skills. But every scouting report I read about him talks about he's like one of the most, you know, communicative defensive players they've ever seen, which is kind of an odd thing to see in a scouting report because you don't often see that. But you need guys like that. You know, and if you don't have a guy maybe that has a little bit of an edge, maybe you got to recruit a guy who has a little bit of an edge, even if these other skills over here aren't exactly what you want, because a basketball team is fitting skills together, but it's also fitting personalities together. And, you know, we're going to see, I don't think that the previous staff seemed to have a great handle on it, or if they understood it, they weren't able to actually execute on it. We're going to find out what Archie and his staff can do. But I think this season shows you sometimes the parts and pieces, one of the reasons why they don't fit together is the personalities just don't match well enough to contribute to on-court success. So it's going to be something interesting to watch. And you don't really know that until you see guys you know, get here and actually see them in the program. Um, but it'll certainly be something interesting to watch. Yeah, and uh, I hate to bring, I hate to interject Purdue into this conversation, but there's been a couple of clips this season from Matt Painter that have kind of gone viral on on Twitter, and just him talking about team building and kind of guys fitting their different roles. and And I think there is a role on every team uh, for a guy who can communicate and kind of be a leader on the court. And it doesn't have to be your. I mean, it's great if it's your best player, but one guy that Painter talked about a lot, and and I think that. This this was a kid that they recruited 
um, that it wasn't a sexy name on the recruiting trail, but you kind of look at what he did over the course of his career, then Dakota Mathias, yeah. because he was a, such a, just a great team player, a guy that could make shots, a guy that could defend. And I think you need more, you, you need guys who are going to accept their role, right? Because you can only have, you know, two or three, maybe superstar, superstar type talents on your team. And then how do the other pieces fit around those guys is ultimately going to, uh, determine the ceiling of your team. I mean, look at Duke this year with, you know, they've got all this top tier talent. It's, it's, undis- it's indisputable, but everyone's talking about, do they have, is Trey Jones going to play well enough in the, in the tournament uh, for them to kind of get to where they want to go? Are the other guys around them going to make shots and, and kind of be the, the willing team guys to, to kind of get them to reach their goals? And I think more than anything else, you got to have those, those pieces around your best players that, that fit in well and that aren't, aren't willing to kind of rattle some, aren't afraid to rattle some cages. You need, you need that guy. And this is the thing that we've talked about a lot recently with Al Durham, right? You see him lately a little bit more being a little bit more vocal, kind of growing into, Hey, this is the end of my second year. I can, I can speak up on the court. I can tell guys uh, that this is what we need to be doing. And I think there's nothing worse than having a quiet team on the court. If, if you're, if, if there aren't guys getting into conflicts with one another, if there aren't guys that are willing to say, Hey, you got to do this better then uh, that, that that's not healthy for a team. You want guys who are, you know what, we're on the court. We're, we're growing together as a team. Uh, there might be some things that are said that are uncomfortable for people, but you know what, it's all part of getting better. That's, to me, that's the, that's the biggest thing uh, is the communication. If if you don't have guys who are willing to step up and call each other out, I'm not talking about fighting in practice or doing anything like that. I'm talking about you need somebody that's going to get in somebody's face and say this is. It can't just be Archie, right? It's got to be yeah. within the team. And so to me, that's it comes back to you know we use the quote uh, cliche glue gli- glue guys all the time, but it's true. I mean, I, I think those are, are kind of the guys that you have to have for three or four years that really help build that culture of winning. Yeah, and you know, I think the coach needs to present and keep the team focused on the overall vision, and it's got to be it's got to come from a place of of mutual respect. You know, if you have guys that are at, that are working hard and you know you're on the same page and working toward the same goal, and you have probably a relationship that extends beyond the court, you can go there with each other. You know, and know that you're you're just out there, it's emotions, you're in the heat of the moment, but you know that guy has your best interest in mind and you both just want to win, then you can go there. You know, and that's what obviously this program needs. And when they've been really good, that's what they've had. And that pretty much extends to probably every sports team that has been successful. So you've got to have that. Uh, TJ21 uh, asked us about one of the most uh, popular topics after the Wisconsin game. How do you see races minutes the rest of this year? Uh, eight to 10 minutes, 20 plus minutes. And he also wonders, do you think that we see more Romeo at the two the rest of the season, considering Devonte appears to struggle uh, to help us and Alan Rob have to get a break? What do you see with those two guys? With Bryce Thompson, I see whatever he can handle. Yep. Um, because right now he's and he's got a long way to go offensively. Let's not annoy him the you know the breakout star of the Big Ten next year because I think offensively he really hasn't shown anything to this point. But what he has shown to me is a guy who's willing to mix it up. And in a game like Michigan State that's coming up. They've got some guys that are going to mix it up, right? That the, they don't have Nick Ward right now. They don't have Josh Langford. They just won at Michigan, and you don't do that uh, w- unless you have some guys who are gritty and they can get after it inside. And I think Race Thompson showed in that Wisconsin game that that's what he has the c- capability of of being. He's a guy that's going to play hard. He's going to go after rebounds. Um, and the thing that really impressed me about him. He just seems like to have a great feel for what he's supposed to be doing out there. That's, you know, a lot of people have asked over the course of the season, why aren't Jake Forrester and Clifton Moore playing more? Well, watch their minutes when they're on the court compared to what race has done, even in his brief time. He just looks like he's got a better feeling for what's going on around him and kind of fitting into what he's supposed to be doing. In terms of Romeo, I mean, I don't, is he playing the three right now? Is he playing the two? I mean, I think his role going forward is he's just playing the, the Romeo. <laughs> yeah. He's just have the ball in his hands as much as possible. Get him as many shots as you can. Uh, the great thing about him is, and almost to a, a fault, is he doesn't force anything. Um, you know, I think there's been times this season where people would have liked to see him kind of get more aggressive and take more shots, but he's he fits well within the team concept. So I, I think 
the rest of the way here, he's going to be used as much as possible um, and uh, getting him uh, as many shots as possible is, is obviously pivotal winning games. And, you know, as for Devontae Green, you know, he is a guy who is now in three of the last four games has played 19 or fewer minutes. Uh, he played 31 at Iowa, but it really has seemed like, you know, his minutes have come because guys have needed to break or have gotten injured. You know, Rob Finnessy or, you know, Rob had that cramp at the end of the Iowa game. Devontae goes back in. I don't think that would have happened. Uh, he was set to play well under 10 minutes against Wisconsin, but that game went to overtime and Al Durham fouled out, you know, and he had to go in and he immediately, you know, made a poor play. And the fact of the matter with Devontae, I think, as everybody's seen, is there have been a few positive outbursts. You know, obviously Indiana doesn't beat Michigan State without Devontae playing one of his better offensive games. But this is now the third consecutive season, or I guess the second consecutive season, where his offensive rating has fallen. His offensive rating was 100.6 as a freshman. It was 91.7 last year. It's 87.2 this year. I mean, he's just not producing when he's on the court and his turnover rate, you know, is back up to 26% and his defense has been erratic. So, you know, I, I think... To me, what you'll probably see moving forward is Rob, Al, and Romeo handling as many minutes as they can handle and as they're available from a foul perspective, and then Devontae coming in after that. And I think if he can accept that role, he can be, you know, a useful player, uh, you know, and maybe earn himself more minutes. If he can't, that's probably where it will stay. At least that's what it seems like based on what we've seen the last four games. Absolutely. Um, Let's see here. Where's the question that I wanted to ask? It is... Ah, right here. Okay, so this is from Casey0507. He said, last night, referencing the Wisconsin game, was the first game I got to attend this year. What are your thoughts on IU's pregame warm-ups? I thought their warm-ups were a perfect summation of how they've played this year. I saw at least two players try to do an Isaiah Ryder dunk, and numerous others shoot extremely lazy-looking layups that weren't close to being game-type shots. Now, I find this question interesting because, you know, Coach Tonsoni, who comes on the show with us on the assembly call and, you know, is a coach, coached in high school in Indiana for 20 years now, he went to the Ohio State game and he messaged me during warmups and was just like, you know, this is, these are some of the most lackadaisical, unfocused warmups that I've ever seen. And he doesn't tend to be too alarmist about things like that, but he... To him, it made perfect sense, you know, why you see them warm up like this and then they start out slow and some of the issues. So I haven't been there to see the team warm up. I'm interested to go Michigan State and see, so I can't really judge. But I've heard and and I've heard this from even more people than that. So I'm just I'm curious to to know what you think. Is this much ado about nothing? Does this not matter? Do you notice a difference when you think back to how other Indiana teams warmed up than how this team warmed up? Like what? What advice would you give to IU fans who go to Assembly Hall and are concerned about the way the team warms up? Because there are many of them out there. I I can't really. I mean, I, I don't. Can can I say that I don't? I don't. I mean, I don't. I've never even thought about this. Um, watched them warm up all season. I've never. I mean, I don't necessarily think it has much to do with performance of a game like and maybe this is a bad comparison because we're talking about professionals but doesn't steph curry like take shots from the stands and warm-ups and do yeah, all but, this crazy stuff? Yeah, but, I mean, but he does that in the games doesn't he <laughs> and makes them <laughs> i know that but it's like i don't necessarily think a guy doing between the legs dunk or being lazy in a layup and i mean they're warming up for an hour before the game do you want them exerting full i i just don't know what people want to see like it, it Pretend that they were like going 110% in warm ups and then all of a sudden they didn't play well. Would it be that they were too worn down? I just. Well, that, that, but that's not, that's, yeah, I mean, that's not the situation we're in. I think people are correlating the two things. No, but, no, but I feel like, I feel like this is one of those things that get discussed when the season's not going. Yeah. Wow. Right. Like I watched Troy Williams warm up for three, three years in Bloomington and I never thought, wow, he's, really locked in but when he when the game ball went up he was ready to play for the most part you know it's it's i don't know i just can't get too like worked up over something like that i just feel like this is and, and slam me if you want in the comments or send us a tweet or whatever i just i just don't think that it's i mean the coaches are out there so obviously if there was a big problem with it they'd be telling them to do something different and i've watched other programs warm up and i don't and i'm not like and i never look at another team and i'm like wow they're way more locked in than iu is today i mean this just guys that are 
they're shooting layups, they're dunking, and they're getting loose. And I just, sorry, I just can't get too, uh, I, I, I can't buy into this too much as a theory of of why things aren't going well. No, sorry. that's it's a it's a it's a good answer. I mean, people are wondering it, and again, people are drawing a correlation that might not, you know, there might not be causation there. They're just saying a lot of poor starts. What I consider lackadaisical warmups, not me, but them saying this, and maybe there's a connection there. So I just I wanted to present it. I'm glad that you provided the alternate. I mean, what, okay, Let, I want to ask you though because I I value your opinion as much as anybody. If you were at a game and you were watching warmups, like what 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 do you want to see? Like that, that that's my whole that's my whole question here. Is is do you want to see guys that are like they look laser focused? I mean, what 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 are you looking for to that would constitute a good warm up? All, all that's coming to mind as you ask me this question is Bob Knight's infamous game face press conference. <laughs> I want to see the game face. No, no, I, no. I, I will say this. I think to a certain extent, it. I, I think each team can be a little different in this case. You know, like I think there are some teams that might need to be a little bit more serious and take warm ups a little bit more seriously, and that's kind of naturally how they are. And if you don't see that, then maybe it's a sign. You know, and I think there are other teams that are probably different and are probably mature enough to be able to do whatever they want warm-ups, and play when the ball is tipped. I don't know this team well enough, the guys well enough. So to that extent, you have to trust the coaches a little bit because, uh, I mean, you know, even if you think the coaches are just totally incompetent, if they're out there watching warm-ups and see something that they think is going to lead to poor play 10 minutes later, surely they're going to say something about it. But, you know, I do think to a certain extent, I just think back to when I was a basketball player, you know, I like to be pretty focused during warmups and work on the kinds of shots I was going to get in the game, you know, work up a little bit of a sweat, you know, just do some of the movements I'm going to do in a game so that I'm not doing them for the first time once the ball tips and my body's warmed up and I'm warmed up and the muscle memory is activated and like <clears throat> all of those things. So that's how I took it. And those are kind of the things that I look for. You know, how confident does a guy look when he's shooting those kinds of things? But I don't know how much it matters, you know, and it's probably something that, you know, for this particular group of guys, only the coaches probably really know. But you're right. People are searching for answers for a season that has defied expectations. And there's a correlation that may not at all be causation. But when you see a team that has started out so poorly, you know, I think it's at least fair to wonder if you see something that jumps out to you that is just, you know, way I mean, worse than what you would expect to at least wonder about it. Okay. Okay. I don't have a problem with the question at all. Like I'm, I'm glad it was asked. I'm glad we talked about it. I'm just saying that I've watched warmups all season, and, and nothing has ever stood out to me as in like these yeah. guys are. Not That's ready why to I wanted play. to get your perspective on it because I figured you'd seen them warm up all the time. So maybe something. Now, do they do out some to stuff you, that not. you're like, why are you doing this? Like a between the legs dunk. Sure, you're not going to do that in a game, but it's also they're out there for an hour, so you can't expect them to be like setting hard picks and <laughs> diving on the ball for. That's right on the floor. Loose balls. I don't, I don't, it's like there's there's a balance, right? I mean, there's it's. It, I, I would I would love to see us run some pick practice, do some pick drills before go. games. How about let's line up full court and then set a pick at half court, <laughs> running full speed, and let's <laughs> practice getting out of the way. I don't know. It's 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 a fair question, and I'm not trying to make fun of it in any way. I think it's a it's definitely a fair question. It's definitely something that other people have brought up to me. I just never have really I have looked at it as as one of the issues. Also, if I could do a between the legs dunk, I feel like that's when I would want to do it. When there's actually some people there to exactly. see me, I can't do that. So imagine I would just go watching there and Zion. Shoot. Imagine watching Zion warm up. Oh man, that'd be fun. That would be fun. Um, all right, let's get let's hit a couple more really quick here. We've kind of covered this, but it's a little bit of a different perspective. So let me just see what you think about this from Lee can how much of Indiana's recent slide is due to unfortunate player injuries causing momentum stalls and how much is due to lack of offensive capabilities. I remember back to Marquette. We don't look like the same team offensively. Is that because we have not progressed over the course of the season like most teams or are we not as good as we were then? What is your take on this? The only thing that I want to add to that, Alex, is we talked about, you know, the shooting issues that this team has had. And what's important to remember is as bad as the shooting has been over the second half of the season, for the first part of the season, it was an interesting storyline that Indiana was in the top 75 in three-point shooting for a while and was actually shooting 37 38%. And we were having the conversation of, hey, I know we want to shoot fewer threes because we're not a great three-point shooting team, but our percentage is pretty good. Is that just because we have great shot selection? Should we be shooting it a little bit more? No, obviously the bottom fell out of that completely. So is that something where you just see that Indiana was 
making a higher percentage of shots than they were capable of, or was the offense functioning so much better to a point that there were just better shots, more in rhythm, that kind of thing? I mean, I think more than anything else, it's lack. It, it was, and I've seen it kind of return these last three games, even though they've only won one out of three games, a lack of confidence in what, what's going on on the court and guys not really having confidence to step up and, and make shots. We've seen it free throws. We've seen it on three-point shooting. Um, you know, when you have a a lot of the game's mental, um, and when you have these types of losing streaks, it's hard to keep confident. And that was one of the interesting questions that I think it was Pat Forty asked uh, Archie towards the end of the press conference the other night. Um, you know, how do you keep guys confident when you're losing so many games? And, and he admitted that it's it's tough. And and so, you know, I mean, some of it's scouting, some of it's you know the IU team. Uh, you know, you can't do the same thing all season and not make a ton of adjustments and expect to continue to be successful because when, especially when you get into the big 10 portion of the schedule, you're scouted so well that uh, you have to introduce new wrinkles and, and maybe Indiana hasn't done enough of that. But I think most of it is just confidence and, and guys um, just, just, you know, when you win a lot of close games that, that kind of breeds confidence. And, and when you start to lose a lot, you kind of question yourself um, and, and question if you can do it anymore. And so I think that's, that's the problem more than anything else. Or has been. I, now, I will say the last three games, I've, I've seen a lot different in terms of, um, like I said, they only won one of the three games, but it, it feels like uh, there's a different kind of belief and a different um, fight from these guys to to, to, to to be right in there and have a chance to pull it out. Yep. All right. A couple more to wrap up here. Uh, this is from Swish. Can you define what the word soon means for a high school senior? I remember when my boys were going to take the trash out or mow the lawn soon that I had a completely different definition <laughs> that I thought now. Uh, this is I'm guessing this is probably in reference to Keon Brooks's upcoming decision where it's felt like a decision might be forthcoming for months and months. Um, what are you, uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I guess before May... That's that's the answer. I mean, I don't like last year we went through this with Romeo, right? Where we all thought he was going to decide by March or he was going to decide by middle of April, and then it got to the end of April when he made the decision. Decision. Um, from what I can gather, um, it seems like this is a situation where kids legitimately torn on what's he, what he wants to do. It's a big decision. So I've always been in the mind of just kind of let. Um, you know, I know for selfish reason, fans want to know where a kid's going because they've invested a lot in the recruitment. They've followed it. They've read about it. They're, they want the kid to come to their school. But we got to start doing time. lineup projections, man, for next season. Exactly. Come on. There's plenty of time for all that in the offseason. So, I mean, you just want, uh, I mean, soon to me means, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Before. he's never put a date on it. So it's hard for me to like, criticize um any recruit for taking their time I and mean, if it, we've talked about this before jared if i was a five-star recruit i'd be waiting till may oh May's yeah i would want to be like i'd want to know who was on the team i'd want to know who's going pro i'd want to know who's what the roster is going to look like before i made a decision so it's it's hard for me to be i mean in terms of college athletes i mean this is a whole other discussion but this is one thing that they do have control over and power over so let them take as long as they want. That's kind of where I sit with it. Last question. Little Hoosier 5. When IU wins it all, will Coach take us to Disney World? What what, what year? <laughs> We're talking this year? I don't know. A year a year was not hey, if they win it all, question. If they win it all this year, then you and I can do a live podcast from uh, Cinderella's Castle. That's a guarantee. Oh man! If they win it all this year, I'll do a live podcast naked, sitting on top <laughs> of Show Walter Fountain. Like any, I, don't, I, I definitely, I'm not going to be a part of that if you're naked. So I, well, no, no one probably would. So everybody would just listen to it as a podcast. No one would watch live. But any, uh, no, no, I, no I, Zoom video for that. No, I'd be willing to make any kind of crazy wagers on that. I mean, I, you know, not that I think that the season is over by any means. Um, I mean, I think this team is still, they have the ability to go on a run down the stretch. The ability. I'm not saying I predict it because we don't really know what to expect from game to game, but I'm at least encouraged that it seems like we've seen a consistent mindset the last three games and the defense has been there. So if they can. I I don't want to get anybody too excited, but I had this question today in the Ask Me Anything on the forum. Somebody asked what Indiana has to do to make the tournament. And 
do you agree with me on this? They need to win the last three regular season games and then get to at least Saturday of the Big Ten tournament to have a chance because if they win the next three, they're probably not playing until Thursday, so that would mean they would probably need to win at least two in the Big Ten tournament uh, to get to 19 wins. Yeah. I think they have a chance at that point based on their quad one wins. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I know you start bucking up against the president, you know, the precedent of, man, so few teams with 14 losses. Maybe one or no teams with 15 losses has ever made it. But, you know, you look at it, if there was going to be a team that would do it, you know, you tend to think that a team like Indiana gets the benefit of the doubt for being Indiana. And they have one of the more remarkable resumes for a team with that many losses just because of their wins. Like, there's all these lists of, like, you know, X teams have this many quad one wins. And it's like all these teams that are firmly in the tournament. Oh, and Indiana. <laughs> like, man, what the hell happened to them? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, if they lose any one of the next three, this obviously it's discussion over. because they have to yeah. win the Big Ten tournament at that point. Right? No no faith in that happening based on the history of the Big Ten tournament? I mean <laughs> I mean, I if we I, I will I, I will believe that we're making it to Saturday in the Big Ten tournament when it happens, and I'll be happy and I'll be so overjoyed by it, but I just cannot for even me, the guy who is known for like you know, predicting us to win every game. Once we get to the Big Ten tournament, I lose, I lose my confidence just because of how. As of right now, I think if the season were to end today, they would play Penn State, which is like playing really well lately. I think one five of seven. So uh, I think that was that'd be a definite game you'd want to avoid uh, to start the Big Ten tournament. But I'm looking forward to it, getting it back in the Midwest. Yeah, hopefully I'm there for more than one day. Hopefully. All right, Alex. Well, thanks for your time. I know you got to jump on the radio, and uh, we appreciate everybody who sent us questions. And uh, we look forward to hopefully having a couple of victories to talk about next week when we come on here. And hopefully, Indiana's making a little run here toward the end of the season. So, absolutely. We will talk to you all next week. Go Hoosiers. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. Remember to join me and my co-hosts for more IU basketball talk at assemblycall.com and visit Alex over at insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana basketball. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink. We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers!